uh, Impact. Go, f- go, go to town. Impact opened with... Go to the town I'm going to buy. The town of uh, Bryan, South Dakota? Mm-hmm. Impact opened with most of Immortal in the Ring. Hogan and Bischoff were not on, on this week, and I don't think they offered an explanation. They just had better things to do. So, Bubba was in the ring cutting a promo about how great they were. He introduced them one by one, talked about how great they all were, and he got to Anderson and said, and this guy, he's just an asshole. So Anderson got pissed, said, hey, you're the one who volunteered me to wrestle Kurt Angle. Why did Anderson get pissed? Because when, when Bubba said that, I, I laughed and thought, how endearing. He, he, that's his gimmick. He's an asshole. Yeah. But then he got mad because he'd been called an asshole. That made no sense. No. Hmm. So... Angle said you volunt- or uh, Anderson said you volunteered me to wrestle Kurt Angle, then you screwed me, and he vowed to get him back. They went back and forth for a while. This somehow led to Anderson singing Rocky Horror Picture. So, thank God, Bubba Ray Dudley spat in his face. Mm-hmm. That was well overdue for singing that song. So this, for some reason, brought out Fortune. Everyone had a fight. Somehow in this mess, James Storm supposedly hurt his back. There's between WWE and uh, TNA is Anderson was told all sorts of things he wasn't allowed to do in WWE, like chomp fucking gum into the mic. And uh, then he went to TNA. It's just like uh, Russo. Uh, when he had all these stupid ideas in WWE, and Vince told him no, and uh, filtered out the real bullshit. And then Russo went to WCW and did every stupid, shitty angle Vince wouldn't let him do, and he killed the company. Mm-hmm. And it's the exact same thing here. Anderson, in WWE, like... I mean, they're not perfect, but... You know, how many guys on WWE are there that really have that go-away heat? Like, when I see the person well, on Michael the show... Cole. Well, actually, that's a good example. You're right. I apologize to uh, TNA. Although, I will continue my statement. You know, Anderson has absolute go-away heat. Absolute go-away heat. Not to the point of Eric Young. And uh, I don't even blame Eric Young. I guess I kind of blame Eric Young. At some point, you got to stand up for yourself. But... I've seen Eric Young when he's just a wrestler, and he's awesome. But whatever the hell it is that they've been doing with Eric Young for the last four years, tonight was a night where the moment I saw him on my television, I fast-forwarded through his entire segment. Yes. I just can't take it no more. It's not funny. It's never funny. It's always stupid. I just I can't handle it. So uh, I have now boycotted uh, Eric Young's segments, and uh, there is a possibility that, that uh, Mr. Anderson interviews could be next. Great. <laughs> Fine with that. We had Madison Rain versus Miss Tessmacher. Mickey James was on commentary. She was talking about Tessmacher's tenacity constantly as a euphemism for her ass. Her ten ass? That's ten ass city. <laughs> yes, I suppose it is. Yeah. So, she uh, Tessmacher is also stealing the... Uh, uh, well, she stole from Kelly Kelly, who stole from other people. But the spot where you rub your ass in the, per- in the opponent's face. And she do- hits this move. And Mickey says, do you know how to block that, Taz? And Taz says, I know how I would block it. With his cock. That's what I was thinking, yeah. You know what's so stupid about this? <laughs> Just, so, Mickey James comes out to do commentary for Miss Tessmacher versus Madison. Mickey's the champion. Right. Pay-per-view on Sunday. So which girl is she facing on Sunday? Why? Neither of these girls. Right. <laughs> that is correct. So these two <laughs> random girls having a match. Yes. And the champion comes out to discuss a match involving two girls she's not wrestling on Sunday. Yeah. All right. So they do the match. Mm-hmm. It went two minutes. Tess Mucker won. Tess Mucker won. Then Madison attacked her. Yeah. Then Mickey... I wrote Mickey saves, but what really happened was Mickey got up from her seat and very slowly walked down the aisle. And as she's going down to make the save, who should attack her but Angelina Love? Well, is that the person she's wrestling on Sunday? Why, no, Vinny, that's not who she's wrestling on Sunday. How odd. So, to recap, two girls are wrestling, the women's champ is doing commentary on the match, neither girl is her opponent... One girl attacks the other, she goes to make the save, and a third girl attacks her, who also is not her opponent on Sunday. And this all finally, in the end, led to Winter coming out and attacking Mickey, who is, in fact, her opponent at the pay-per-view. So, if you have any idea, 
listener, dear listener, what Miss Tessmacher, Madison Rain, or Angelina had to do with any of this. Please alert me. Yes, this all started with Madison versus Tessmacher and ended with Winter standing triumphant over Mickey James. Overbooked nonsense. We got a uh, shot of the leaderboard. Crimson was in first. James Storm was in second, and then a bunch of guys were tied. Why can Winter just come out and beat Tessmacher? And then, and then, uh, and then the champion does commentary and go, "My, what a threat to my title on Sunday!" Because oh. that would be too easy. Oh, Brian, come on now. I did love the uh, James Storm Bound for Glory video package where he's talking about the sacrifices he made during his career, and he mentions how he had to leave his daughter at home while he worked two hundred and fifty days a year. That's what he said. Your average WWE wrestler who wrestles anywhere from three to four days a week. Legitimately does about 140 to 160 dates a year. James Storm claimed he worked 250 dates for TNA last year. I LOL'd. <laughs> Devon wrestled AJ in a Bound for Glory series match. This. All right. Pope came out to sit next to Devon's kids. This distracted Devon. Then Daniels came down to, I guess, ask AJ for another match. This distracted AJ, and Devon pinned him with a schoolboy. Mm-hmm. And it ended with Devon yelling at Pope and Daniels yelling at AJ. whoop de doo Yeah. I will say that Devon's family consists of uh, two boys and a absolutely smoking hot black girl. I don't know if that's supposed to be his wife or his daughter or who that's supposed to be. But uh, she is a uh, a treasure. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Should pay more attention. You didn't see this girl? I did not. Oh my god. Hmm. Angle did a promo about his uh, championship match. He talked about training for the uh, Olympics. Said he was in the best shape of years. He said he was down twenty eight pounds. We haven't mentioned this much because there's so much else to talk about in Impact. But yes, I believe him. Kurt Angle has looked phenomenal lately. So great. Bully Ray looks like he's lost 128 pounds. He actually has definition in his arms and shoulders now. Bully Ray! That's impressive. I'll say. Pope did a promo. Said he has to wrestle uh, Samoa Joe tonight. He vowed to win there. Then he's going to wrestle Devon of the pay-per-view. He said they would do what they had to do and entertain the fans, and afterwards they would still be friends. I think that Bully Ray Dudley is in better shape than you. Could be. That's that's mind boggling. He, he was once incredibly fat. He really was. He was pushing four bills. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Odd that twenty years after this he's decided to get in shape, but <laughs> twenty years later he's in better shape than you. Better late than never. Yeah. That's what I'm saying about myself too. Pop Russell Joe. They had a fine TV match. Joe won by submission. So the whole all these weeks, Samoa Joe hasn't gotten a single point. He's been shut out of the tournament. And he finally gets his finishing hold on a guy, and the guy taps out, and Samoa Joe has won. And then he would not let go of the hold, and he was disqualified. Yeah. So he's a buffoon. He now has minus 10 points. Does he? I'm not making that up. I did not know that. Yes, he lost 10 points via this disqualification. So Samoa Joe is now at minus 10 points. He is worse than not wrestling at all. If it had not been proven over the last 120 years that losing streaks have never, ever gotten a single human being over in the history of wrestling, then this would be an awesome angle. But instead, Joe then later cut a furious promo about how angry he was. Yes. And I looked at him, and he was a buffoon. Yeah. You're a buffoon, especially in this one, because you had the win. It's not anyone's fault but your own that you refuse to let go of the hold. You are not screwed. No one's against you. You're just a jackass. This poor guy. Yep. James Storm was backstage selling his back. He had a street fight tonight against uh, Hernandez, but Rude saw how hurt his partner was and said, now, now, the tag team title is the most important thing out there. I'll take this street fight tonight. You rest up and we'll defend our tag belts to the pay-per-view. And Storm said, okay. Yeah. Bubba Ray Dudley was bitching on the phone to Hulk Hogan. He uh, said he refused to apologize, but Hulk made him, so he said fine, and he would go do it. Robert Roode 
versus Hernandez in a completely random street fight. A, a single street fight instead of the tag team title match on the pay-per-view. This is nitpicky, but I'm going to say it anyway. Hernandez wrestles from Mexican America. They hang the Mexican flag out before all their promos. Mexican flag is red, white, and green. So he's out here in what color? Blue. That annoyed me. It was That'd a, be nitpicky. It was a street fight. Especially feat. on this particular it show. It was a street fight. They had all sorts of plunder out there. They hit each other with things. Hernandez just looked like he didn't give a shit if uh, Rude was just hitting the face of the head with various plunder. Just wha- whapping him with stuff. It was terrible. So then here in this street fight, a street fight, Rude hooks him in an arm bar, and Hernandez taps out, but there's mm-hmm. no referee. Yeah. The referee is distracted by one of the other Mexicans. Storm got involved, everyone interfered, and eventually Hernandez won with the schoolboy. So aside from the stupidity of, uh, you know, having a tap out in a street fight, but there's no ref, if you're going to have four people interfere, why don't they just jump at the bell and beat them up four on one? <laughs> because nobody thinks in this particular company. This is a company that didn't know if you were supposed to actually ring the bell between falls in a best of three falls match. They build this as a no disqualification match, and the next thing you know, they're they're attempting to go for pins on the floor. That also happened, yes. Yeah. These people have absolutely no idea what they're doing. We have a uh, Robert well, Rude, by the way, is awesome. He is in fact a great wrestler. Robert Rude is like the uh Well, he's he's just fantastic. The finish of this match sucked. I was just watching it going, God damn, Robert Roode is awesome. This is the best match of Hernandez's career. And then when they did the uh, schoolboy finish, and Roode is practically in the middle of the ring, and Hernandez completely stretched out with his feet on the ropes, has his weight over uh, Robert Roode's hips. And so it is it is impossible to believe that Robert Roode can't kick out, but he doesn't kick out, and uh, it completely sucked. But other than that, this match was great. I don't even know whose fault that was there. I don't either. Bubba met up with uh, Mr. Anderson. He said, I'm here to apologize. Anderson didn't accept. Ray took his uh, hat off, which I guess is a sign of, of uh, you know, a symbol of honesty and, and, and purity. And uh, said, I'm here to apologize. <laughs> I don't do this very often. I am feel like a jerk off here with my hand extended. Please accept that I'm sorry. So Anderson finally relented and he grabbed Ray's hand and Ray promptly kneed him right in the nuts. I laughed. That was funny. I actually completely fell for this hook, line, and sinker. And it was a good swerve. This was a rare good swerve. Yeah. And and, and now it, it... Because Bully lied. He, Bully didn't really well, get a... He didn't really get a call from Hulk Hogan. It was a lie. And then he went and he lied to Anderson. And Anderson fell for it. And then he kicked his ass. Now, why did Bully Ray fake a phone call to Hulk Hogan in a segment that Anderson was not in and that only we saw? Well, because of his impact. But still... A hey, heel made another heel look like an idiot. There, Great. there may have been that may have been a legitimate call with Hogan. Doubtful. He, he may have said, "Fine, I'll apologize." And Hogan will say, "Why do you kick him in the nuts?" And Ray will say, "You didn't tell me not to. I did everything you said." It's fine. Yeah, it, it was fun, and, and now they're going to fight. So this is a good build to their match. Austin Aries versus Alex Shelley. They had a very fun match. Although nothing is ever that simple in Impact. So, Aries goes to grab his jacket, which has spikes on it. And this distract the refer- distracted the referee. So then, with the referee's back turn, Aries hit a low blow, and then he hit a brain buster and got the pin. Then he began to brag to Shelly about how he won the match with a wrestling move. Are, were we watching a completely different match? What was I wrong about? Um, the finish- Everything? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the, the referee was distracted, but then Aries grabbed, or I'm sorry, uh, uh, Shelly grabbed him and was going to do the, uh, he was going to do the sliced bread, but as he was running towards the corner, Aries shoved him, and Shelly bonked into the corner, at which point Aries hit a brain buster and did, in fact, pin him clean with a wrestling maneuver. I summarized it. I believe what happened was the when Shelly took the turnbuckle bump, he went into the turnbuckles, and, and after that, Aries kicked him in the nuts. Hmm. There's a lot going on in these finishes. Regardless, I don't give a shit because this match was awesome. Yeah, it sure was. And I believe that uh, Austin Aries has had the best match on every single show that he has appeared on in TNA. 
And this is a man who would not even make tough enough for WWE. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that is correct. And your point about him having the best match every week is probably true. Somebody find out. So find out if there's been a show that Austin Aries has been on where somebody had a better match than he did. Was there a better one on Destination X? Actually, I think so. Because he was in the uh, Ultimate X and there, I, I, something was... I forget now. No, he's in the four-way to win a contract. Oh, you're right. No, that was the great. That was a great fucking match. He was been. I think he's been the best match on every show that he has been on. A man who would not even make the cut for tough enough. Yeah. What does that tell you about WWE? Well, TNA is using a guy better. Well, I can't say better than WWE because WWE didn't hire him. So that's a, that's a that, that's ten points for TNA here in the Bound for Glory series tournament. Sure. A lot of Eric Young stuff we skipped. Then Kurt Angle did commentary on an empty arena match he did with Sting in 2009. Just, we, they, they may have aired the entire match. I can't believe how good Austin Aries was in the show. <laughs> Couldn't even make tough enough. Yeah. <laughs> he wasn't as good as Miss USA or uh, Luke. Or uh, was that one girl that got eliminated on the first show? She made the cut. <laughs> or the one who thought Melina had the best match she ever saw? Andy. And he won. And Austin Aries didn't even make the cut. Yeah. Hmm. Jeremiah Riggs. Yeah. That's his name. All better than Austin Aries. I can understand wanting to, uh, I don't know. That's I, the reason I gave up on that show three weeks in. Just preposterous. Main event match. Gunner and Scott Steiner versus Rob Van Dam and Crimson. I would pay maybe hundreds of dollars to get Scott Steiner's honest opinion of what it's like to wrestle Rob Van Dam. I just have a feeling he hates this goof. Rob was uh, horrible. Rob Van Dam was horrible in this match. Mm -hmm. I don't know if he was hurt. I don't know if he's just getting old. But, my God, he did he did a spot where he was running the ropes. And, and literally, I could run the ropes faster doing a handstand. I could I could do a handstand and walk to the ropes and bounce off and move back to the middle of the ring and I would move faster than Rob Van Dam did upright running, and they tried to do his backflip over the guy and that was in slow motion. He got the hot tag and as he's getting into the ring he tripped on the ropes. This happened. He tripped on the ropes getting into the ring. He did a frog splash which looked no good. He crushed Scott Steiner at one point on the Rolling Thunder. Which happens all the time. I don't. I really don't know what was wrong with him here. He was horrible in this match. And then, on Sunday, everybody, in a singles match, <laughs> on live pay-per-view, not a tape show that can be edited, on live pay-per-view, it is Rob Van Dam versus Crimson in a singles match. Yeah. So, wow. Rob went through this match in which he looked very bad. He still got the win on Scott Steiner, which means he also got the points in the match. And then, Which, by the way, the entire point... How many times have I said this? Yeah. The entire point of the gimmick where the Bound for Glory series has tag matches and only the man who gets the pin or the submission gets the points. That is stupid. This entire <laughs> thing was designed to give teams a reason to fight each other, which up until the Bound for Glory series, they did every fucking week on every show. Yeah. Teams always fought each other. Now they design a Bound for Glory series where, by design, teams should fight each other, and now nobody fights each other. No more fighting. Because that would make fucking sense. Yes. You're very angry about that, aren't you? It just pisses me off. It was like, you know, for once they had a reason for this bullshit. Uh -huh. And then, as soon as they make a, make, make a sensible reason for teams to hate each other, not a single team gets in a fight. That's true. Why the fuck wasn't Crimson angry? Crimson is in first place, and Rob Van Dam is hot on his trail. And Crimson did not give a fuck that Rob Van Dam just got another seven points. Oh, you're right. It's just so stupid. Why? Why did you guys bother? <laughs> Why did you bother? I don't know. I just don't get it. So afterwards, we got a Rob Van Dam post-match promo. I don't know what he said. <sighs> he was blown up. He was his mind was wandering. He said he won, and Crimson saved the day. Crimson saved the day. 
He said they were going to wrestle a Sunday, and he said no matter what happened tonight, on Sunday he'd be the better man. He'd come out with the points, and afterwards they would shake hands and be friends again. Apparently there's going to be a lot of handshaking on Sunday. I guess so. I don't think so. So we got a Kurt Angle and Sting contract signing. They had the most unintentionally hilarious line in this. All right. Usually they try and write comedy and it doesn't work. This time, they just had a line that was so goddamn funny to me. Sting comes out, and it's hard to describe what he was wearing. But he was like wearing a a black button-up shirt with the sleeves not rolled up, and black pants and, like, dress shoes. And he had his, his face painted up like Picasso had done the Joker. And then on top of that, he was wearing sunglasses. Yes. And he's standing here in this absolutely goddamn ridiculous getup. And Kurt Angle looks him dead in the eye and goes, there are a few men I respect in this business, but you're one of them. I laughed so fucking hard. Well, I laughed so hard at Kurt Angle telling this man dressed in this manner that he was one of the only men in this business he respected. Yeah. And it was not meant to be funny, but it was it was just a side splitter to me. So on that note about what a uh, failure the Joker Sting has been, Kurt cut his promo about how he was going to win. It was very boring. Sting then took the mic, and he stopped being Joker Sting. He cut a serious Sting promo, and it was the best thing he's done in months. Of course. He put over Kurt like a king of men, talked about all he had done in wrestling, all, all, all the things he could do in a pro wrestling ring, all he had done in amateur wrestling, including an Olympic gold medal, something no one else could say. Then he moved on to talking about how important the belt is to him because he needs it to get the company back to Dixie, which is bullshit, but at least if he believes that, I believe he believes it. And then finally he said, uh, no matter what happens on Sunday, Kurt, I'm not going to say you'll have to kill me to win this belt, but you'll come damn close. And they played his music and it was over. This promo was the best thing in the show by a mile. It well, was. The, I, the, the Aries match, except for that. I, I am a big fan of Sting when he's not being the Joker. I'm a big fan of serious Sting. I think the problem was that maybe maybe I, I praised Sting so much that they decided they must find a way to make me hate Sting. So they gave him a Joker gimmick, blatant ripoff from the movie. All I know for real is that uh, this was going along fine until he had to bring up the line about his entire goal. He does this great promo, and then his conclusion, his conclusion leading to the pay-per-view Sunday is, my ultimate goal before I go is to get this company back to its rightful owner. And so, therefore, I cannot lose on Sunday. Yeah. And that just killed it for me. Well, yeah. Really, why can't you lose a championship to Kurt Angle on Sunday? What in the fuck does that have to do with anything? I don't know. Even even if you pretend, even if you pretend that somehow if the heels get control of the title, Dixie can never come back, which in itself is just ridiculous. But even if you pretend that, Kurt Angle is not a heel. He is your other top babyface. That's true. What the fuck difference does it make if Kurt Angle or Sting has the title? And moreover, what the fuck does it have to do? What difference does it make? Who has the championship? Whether or not Dixie Carter comes back to this fucking company. If even one time, a person who had the title exercised power, even one time, then I would be like, okay, fine. But all they do is talk about how he who has the title has the power. Well, you know what? Who has the title right now? Sting. Who has the power? Bully Ray tonight. Yeah, Bully Ray, Eric Bischoff, and Hulk Hogan. They have the power every week. Bully Ray is signing matches. Bully Ray last week signed a match with Mr. Anderson and Kurt Angle. Bully Ray is running the fucking show. Bully Ray is not champion. Bully Ray has never even been the champion. And I have seen no display of power by Sting. Except for last week he lied and claimed he was a network guy, when in fact he wasn't. It just drives me nuts. You know, for that matter, while we're on the topic, if he needs the belt to bring Dixie back, well, he's got the belt. Where is she? Bring her back. I guess you need the belt for eight months. <laughs> you need the belt for an, a certain amount of time before you actually have the power. I hadn't thought of that. I don't know. All I know is that no one's buying the pay-per-view Sunday. At least, the, the, the bright side, on the bright side, I can name at least one match on this pay-per-view. On the bright side, I know there's a pay-per-view on Sunday. 
That is an improvement over last go the last go home show when the show ended, and I in fact did not know there was a pay per view on Sunday. Literally, when I was recording Observer Live last Sunday, and and Mike Sempervivi and I were talking about this show, I could not name a single. Ma- I didn't even know what the main event was last Sunday. So at least I know that the main event is Angle and Sting now. To somehow bring Dixie back. I don't know. All right, everybody. That is it from here. Let's uh, play one last song before we uh, before we wrap it up today. And uh, and then we'll be on our merry way. To the back! That's pretty good. That's pretty great. We should open the show with that every time. That was pretty good. All right, Vinny. You got uh, five minutes to give your uh, raw report here. And then we got tons, shit tons of shout outs. Can I talk about Impact instead? Impact? There was a great segment on Impact. Oh, Jesus. We didn't even review Impact, did we? I don't, did you watch it? No. You, if you still have it, you must go down and watch one segment. Jeff and Karen Jarrett came out. <laughs> I heard about this. This <laughs> actually was, does sound awesome. Jeff was wearing blue jeans, no shirt, a poncho, and a sombrero. Karen was in a, uh, a tight red dress with a rose in her hair and matching red lipstick. Looked fabulous. The only thing this was missing, they should have had a mariachi band playing Jeff's theme song. That would have been money. So Jeff came out, they showed clips of him winning the AAA title with an illegal cane shot, and you can see in this uh, in this uh, video that the ref's back was turned. AAA makes more sense than TNA. So they actually showed clips from the building? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I didn't think they'd do that. So uh, Jeff announced that uh, to the crowd that he had won this title in Mexico, he had been crowned the king of Mexico, and yet people were not taking him seriously. He said he had taken over the biggest company in Mexico, conquered an entire country, and brought back their world title. That was not enough. He said he needed to, uh, to, to get himself over to the Mexican people. He said he needed to learn the nuances and the subtleties of the Mexicans. That's what he said. He needed to be endorsed by the Mexican people so everyone would realize how serious he was about this. He talked about all this, the, the great Mexican cities he had been in, such as San Antonio, and uh, there's a few others in the U.S., and uh, he had finally found two Mexican brothers to come out and endorse him. And so he introduced the, the, the I believe he said they were the Lopez brothers, but two Mexicans, Jose and Hose B. <laughs> Fantastic. He announced these men were landscapers at Universal Studios. Two Mexican men came out. They had a fancy entrance with smoke, lights, Mexican flag, cool music. They came out and they just looked bewildered by the entire scene. They didn't know what to make of any of this. Jeff said they had drank too many cervezas. They got in the ring. They were kind of wandering and milling about, still kind of, uh, you know, not sure what was going on. And Jeff said, J- you're like a lot of the other wrestlers in TNA. You don't know how to find the camera. I laughed at that, too. So he asked them to, in their own words, just pl- please hear and before everyone publicly endorse him as the king of Mexico. Uh, and, and, and Karen was his queen. Whatever you want to say. And the two Mexican men just said, K, repeatedly, over and over again. And Jeff said, no, J, double J. But please, endorse me as king. And so they couldn't do this. Nothing happened. And then, out of the corner of their eye, they spotted Hector Guerrero. A member of the famed Guerrero family. Legendary in Mexico. And they went apeshit. They went ballistic. They couldn't believe their hero was here. They, uh, this surprised everyone, including Hector. Hector was uh, stunned that anyone recognized him. So Jeff tried one more time to please get an endorsement. But Jose and Jose B announced that, in Spanish... The Guerrero family were the kings of Lucha Libre. They cut great promos in Spanish about how great the Guerreros were. Finally, Jeff could take no more. He kicked both their asses. Hector grabbed a chair and hit the ring to make the save. The Jurists ran away. Seriously, one of the best segments of the entire year. This I must see. This was awesome. You had the heel coming out and being all goofy. It's fine that the heel had the motivation that he wanted to be to be declared the king of mexico because that's silly you're not supposed to respect the heel but then at the end he beat up two men he is still dangerous so uh i assume this is all going to eventually lead to chavo guerrero coming in which is not the best news in the world but uh this segment Eh, was you know what i think chavo guerrero and jeff Jarrett will have good matches this uh, you know what if they have horrible matches I'm fine, because it started with this segment. And their horrible matches will remind me of this segment. And it was great. This was an A-plus stuff. Everyone just remembers Chavo's last matches were like, he was trying to be a luchador, which he's not. No. But, uh, you know, Jeff Jarrett, old Southern style worker, and Chavo, you know, he's done WWE style his whole life. They will have good matches. They're both very, very, I was going to say competent, they're better than that. They are good. They They will have good matches. They are good workers. Mm Mm-hmm. 
So, yes. Everyone, uh, watch Impact. Just that part. Anything else good on the show? Oh, there was some good wrestling. There was a, 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 a women's match that was not very good that I, I saw a lot of people absolutely hating, which I had nothing was that bad. It just is a women's tag match. And, and by the way, remember we were talking about maybe her name is Brooke Tessmacher? Mm-hmm. That's her name now. Oh. She was Tara and Brooke Tessmacher. And there was a point where she got the hot tag and she hit the ring and whatever she was going to do, she clearly just completely forgot it. And she just stood there and the two heels both attacked her. And there's a lot of stuff, you know. It's a taped show. It's a tape show, and they didn't edit that out. And, uh, uh, you know, the Jersey Shore crew, uh, they, they, they broke up. They, oh, no. Well, this is not, it's not even, it's not even, oh, no. It's that there was no build to this. There was never a point in earlier shows they were arguing. They came out. They had an argument. Then backstage, they broke up, and that was it. I, I can't even remember the last time they were even on the show. Yeah. <laughs> so, and there's I was the, actually looking at the TNA roster, and, and I saw Cookie's name, and I was like, she's still employed? Totally forgotten they existed. Maybe not anymore. Hmm. There was a point where she tried to interfere in the match. Taz pointed out she was interfering right in front of the referee. I love Taz. Yeah. And, you know, the usual goofy stuff. Like, eight different people appear to be in charge, depending on which segment's going on. And Did any of them have the title? Because I was always told the title... Angle, brings- Angle did, in fact, hit the ring with the title and say that now he was in charge. He called the shots, he said. And I guess if we're discussing this, he, he cut his promo in the middle of the show, and he explained... That what was going on was that uh, the reason he was angry, he was angry at Dixie Carter, who you will know does not own the company and has not been on TV in months. But he explained that he went to, to Dixie and he said, I think Jeff's fucking my wife. And Dixie didn't do anything. So uh, I've, <laughs> it's kind of complicated. I've lost, uh, lost track of my notes here. The point is Hulk Hogan knew Hulk uh, confided in Kurt. I think Jeff's fucking your wife. And so that's why uh, that's why Kurt was mad at Dixie because she didn't do anything about it. So he vowed to now that he won the title, he was going to take the young guys that Dixie was going to uh, surround him with and build the company. He was going to take them out so he'd be the only one left. What a stupid storyline! Well, only uh, yes, it's all very stupid and convoluted and illogical. But the point was, uh, it was revealed that Hogan was Kurt's confidant and his informer. Then why did Kurt? Hit Hulk at the pay per view. He hit Sting. Yeah, he hit Sting with a chair, but Hogan had the chair, and Kurt attacked Hulk and grabbed the chair. Oh, he just grabbed the chair from him. But my, my question is why? To the back! Right, let's do. Uh, I feel like running down Impact in about two and a half minutes. This show sucks. It's just. It's just stupid. This felt like. Ordinarily, we talk about how Impact, there's too much shit going on. This felt like uh, they wrote a one-hour show and found out during the filming that it was two hours and just had everything go forever. Better normal one-hour show still has three hours worth of stuff, so yeah. keep that in mind. Yeah. Should we start? Go for it. I'll start. Sting came down the ramp, having a match with an invisible man. He hit the ropes and took bumps and stuff and said this proved he was crazy. He said he wanted to wrestle Hogan. He made reference to Eye of the Tiger, a song that came out, I believe, in 1983. 30 years old now. We're going back in time. It's been a while. So uh, he called out Hogan. He got Flair. Flair said everyone wanted to know when he was was going to wrestle Sting again. I bet that's not true. So he challenged Sting to a match in which if Sting lost, he must retire. Which I swear he's lost like four of those matches. And by the way, he added, no, for real this time. You really have to go home. <laughs> oh, that made me believe it. Oh, God. Uh, yes, and he said if Sting could beat him, he would offer a Hulk Hogan on a silver platter. I'm not sure what that means. I assume it's not literal. But uh, Sting said Ric Flair smelled like garlic, and he accepted. So he said, you smell like garlic, Rick, but I want the match. All right. That was the opening segment. After commercial, Flair went backstage to find Hulk Hogan. Hulk yelled at him, said Sting should be dead. Actually, the first thing Hogan said was, and this is, I swear to God, a direct quote. Are you on goofball pills or something? (laughs) That's what he said. Are you on goofball pills? He asked. So they shouted at each other for a long time. Flair wanted uh, beer and or wine. They rambled on like lunatics forever. Two crazy old men. And by the end of this, I have no idea if anything got settled. Flair was... Hogan was mad 
Flair said, don't worry. I'm 1,501 against him. Maybe 1,502. Greatest wrestler of all time. I'll kick his ass. I'll send him back to California. Don't worry about it. Hogan was all pissed off. Swore to God he would never wrestle this man. They made their point, and then they kept talking. And then after that, they kept talking. This was like when Kurt Angle was training for the Olympics in 1990. Well, for the 1996 Olympics, probably 1995. And he's doing all this completely crazy shit. And his his philosophy was, I'm going to train until I can't train no more. And that's when training starts. Kurt hated that. So don't do that in your angles where you keep going and you make your point and there's no more point to be made and then you keep going. And then when you've totally exhausted your point, that's when you start. That's what they did here. And it actually got a lot worse later in the show. This is the first of many on the show. We saw some clips of Bound for Glory matches. Bully Ray beat Devon and the, the finish of their feud we never actually got to see. The show the leaderboard and the the key is that the top four guys at the end uh qualify for the finals or whatever. So the top four are Crimson, Bully Ray, Rude, and James Storm, and just outside are Devon and Gunner. So there you go. So we had Devon versus St- uh, Scott Steiner. Matt Morgan on commentary said this was the most grueling tournament he'd, he'd ever seen. So he said and it, as he said this, this match went 60 seconds and Scott Steiner won with his feet on the ropes. Mm-hmm. So don't tell me, everybody, <sighs> that I didn't predict this. Many of you will remember the show that I did with Dave where I was ready to wrap up the show and suddenly he said, we, we've got to talk about the TNA Bound for Glory tournament. And for 15 minutes, he explained how this could be awesome. And for 15 minutes, I explained, this won't be awesome. This is TNA. It's going to suck. Yes. He compared it to the G1 Climax tournaments and the, the champion carnivals of old. Maybe he didn't go that, quite that far. But suffice to say, of course I was right. It's, it's impact. It's impact. This tournament sucks. Oh, there's more. This tournament is just lame. So, Devon... Uh, what does what? What anything have to do with anything in this tournament? Bunch of guys have points, and matches completely at random occur. They go one minute. <laughs> you know, during this match, by the way, as noted, this match went one minute. As Matt Morgan's talking about, this is the most grueling tournament he'd ever seen. And in this one minute, they spent the one minute talking about how Devon's lost, like, 60 pounds. He's in the best shape of his life. He looks great. And suddenly he's pinned by Scott Steiner with the feet on the ropes. This is why nobody gives a shit about anything in this company. Anything. So this sucked. But there is more. There is more. Devon lost. He was then attacked from behind by Samoa Joe. Joe lead him out, put him in a heel hook, and then the announcers could identify, not even Taz. Morgan was indignant, said that Joe should have shown this kind of fire in the tournament. This is true. It would have been better if Joe had shown this kind of fire in the tournament, instead of having negative 10 points. So, eventually, uh, Devon's kids hit the ring and con- convinced Joe into stopping killing their dad. He was about to kill them when Pope showed up and Joe bailed. So, they went to commercial. When they came back, Joe cut an angry promo. Oh, my God. Samoa Joe, God bless the guy. He, he cannot watch this show and think this is any good. Of course not. But he has such passion when he's screaming. I've been watching Samoa Joe scream for five years now, at least. I think it was 2006 that he showed up and and did the thing with Kurt Angle. It may have been one long scream. I've been watching him scream in an angry manner for five years. And and aside from uh, two great pay-per-view numbers five years ago, in the last four and a half years, what has all of this screaming done for Samoa Joe? Absolutely nothing. He screams, he screams, he screams, he screams. He gets mugged. He vanishes. He comes back. He screams, he screams. He does a bunch of jobs. He screams some more. Now he does a bunch of jobs, and he's got minus 10 points in the Bound for Glory tournament. So he starts screaming again, and now we're supposed to think, "Uh uh-oh, Joe's mad. He's going to kill some folks. Instead, he just screams. And you watch it, and you move on with your life. That's because this show sucks. He screams for about 20 minutes here. And he explained that his goal was to injure everyone in the tournament. You recall last week, Kurt Angle hit the ring and explained that his goal was to injure all the young guys. So there are now two guys doing the I'm going to kill everyone gimmick. That's and by the way, what a what a storyline. 
I can't win this tournament, so I'm going to beat everyone up. Yeah. I guess that's what a heel does. I suppose. But we're supposed to take this man seriously. Are we? I guess. I mean, of course. <laughs> Are we? They they presume we take everything here seriously, when in fact we take nothing seriously. Because the the because uh, this show sucks. On that note, a bunch of geeks came out. One of them had a football, for Christ knows what reason. It was, was his gimmick. <laughs> as if... Someone's going to be watching it at home, and they're about to flip the channels, and then, oh, wait a minute, that guy's got a football. This man's got a football I player. I turn the channel. This guy with a football might... Well, I don't know. Well, was... what will happen is this man with the football will have a 30-second match. That is what happened. In a series of 30-second matches. That is what happened. This was a... They did the X Division gauntlet, which was a way to have every X Division guy get pinned in a minute. Mm-hmm. That's what happened here. Uh... Haskins, whose first name I did not even bother to write down, the English guy who looks like John Morrison, he did 400 moves with Alex Shelley and pinned him with a go-to-sleep kind of thing. Then Robbie E. was up next. Last week, Robbie E. and Cookie broke up. This week, they came out together. Then as soon as it was Robbie E.'s turn to get in the ring, they started fighting again, and Haskins immediately uh, pinned him. Haskins versus Zima Ion. Zima Ion did the most indie-rific, goofy shit. That's all I can call it. This offense that he used. Stupid. He won with a 450 where he landed on his own face. Again, one minute. Up next was Sorensen. One minute. Ion tried the 450 again. Sorensen got his knees up and he won with what was basically crossroads. Tony Nice was next. One a minute. Sorensen won with crossroads again. Kid Cash was in the ring. This is the sixth man in. They went to a commercial break, and as soon as they came back, Sorensen rolled him up and pinned him. Mm-hmm. So now it was the finals of the gauntlet match. Sorensen, who had just won three matches in a row against Austin Neres, who was fresh. Before they could start, Kid Cash snuck into the ring. He hit his double underhook pile driver on Sorensen. Aries got in the ring. He put his foot in his chest. Sorensen kicked out. So Aries did some more offense and pinned him with a brain buster in a minute. Yeah. This sucked. Also, also, they know that the Kid Cash, due to his loss, was going to be ranked number three. Yes. They are doing rankings now in the X Division. Because they haven't fucked that up 500 times before. Wasn't he ranked number three about eight years ago the first time they tried Probably. this? Probably. Still waiting for him to get his latest title shot. So, yeah, this is this is uh, terrible. The good oh, news it gets is, better. It gets better. Well, Kendrick comes out in his stupid pants. First, Austin Aries cut a great promo. He did cut a promo. That part promo. was great. Yeah. Kendrick came out in his, in his, in his apron. He uh, wanted to shake hands. Aries gave him the... Uh, what do you call the, the when you off your hand, you pull it back, you do the hairbrush thing? Sure. Yeah. And he walked up the ramp, so Brian Kendrick, babyface champion, attacked him from behind. Yeah. Lead he him attacked out. him from behind. Like a coward. Oh my god. That's not a stupid. Who books this stuff I wrote as a as a rhetorical comedy question? Yeah, they 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 put together a cool bound for glory ad about uh the history of Philadelphia. It's long, but it's good. Jackie and ODB were backstage talking about ODB's match with Mickey James. They still don't have contracts. I, they do not have contracts. They don't I, work I for this long company. Since stopped caring. I want someone to go back and do the research and tell me how many times on this show have they wrestled for free? It's oh. got to be in the dozens. I'm sure they've been wrestling for free when they were under contract. Fair point. Tracy showed up. She wants a job. She told uh, Bischoff that she can be knockout law again. Knockout Law, a storyline from years back that was no good. <laughs> yeah. Brought back here in 2011. They have nothing else for her to do. Eric looked at her boobs and liked them, and so he said, come back next week. ODB and Mickey James had a fun match. They got a decent amount of time, probably six minutes. It was fun. Mickey won clean with her DDT. I assume ODB and Jackie will be back next week. The storyline, apparently we missed a deal somewhere. Where Bischoff told uh, ODB and Jackie they could have jobs as long as they don't cheat. So they come out and wrestle, and they are tempted to cheat, but they don't, and they still have no jobs. I'm amazed you figured that out, because I had no idea what was going on. There's one line of commentary here, because they, they... Yeah, last week, Jackie just refused to cheat, and this week, the same thing. When Mickey got thrown outside, and Jackie went over there, and the last second, she pulled her act self together and, 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 and withdrew. But, yeah, that's what's going on. They, 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 the, the women with no jobs are following the rules. I gotta talk about this next segment. Carry on. I know I didn't see last week's show. I know that I really am trying very hard not to care. But Angelina and Winter are backstage having a meeting. 
and Winter is drinking wine and talking about how holding the title must be like fucking. And she wants to fuck forever. So, I could have sworn she said she was going to win the title in two weeks. Which, I was overcome with confusion. I thought, because of course, nobody tells us anything on this show. I thought that perhaps they had stolen the belt from Mickey. And so in two weeks, it was winter trying to win the championship from Mickey that they had stolen. Now, the fact of the matter is, I know there are some of you that are hardcore impact viewers that are listening right now and going, oh, for fuck's sake, Brian. But listen, I don't care who the champion is. I don't care what the angle is. They did a horrible job. In fact, I can't even say a horrible job. They didn't even do a job. They did not even try to explain this to the viewer. So, I was forced, in the middle of this show, to go online and go to Wikipedia and find out who the fucking champion is. Now, for those of you that are running independent groups, or maybe someday your goal is to write television, maybe you want to be a WWE writer someday, or work for Ring of Honor, or whatever the case might be, Listen, your viewer should never have to go online and go to Wikipedia to find out what the fuck is going on. Because no one cares about your show. Let me explain this to the people writing Impact. No one cares about your show. Yes, I realize you got 7,500 viewers that paid for your last pay-per-view. I realize that there are are one and a half million people watching. Okay, but I don't care about the 1.5 million people watching. Because on Spike, you know, half of those people are going to watch a test pattern. Just a fact. So then you've got the people that are going to watch wrestling just for the sake of wrestling. But they don't care because if they did care, they would buy your pay-per-views. But they don't. So really, 7,500 people care about your pay-per-view. Which is less people than listen to an average Brian and Vinny show for free on Tuesdays. So nobody cares about your fucking show, which means that nobody knows off the top of your head who your fucking women's champion is. So when you got two girls and there's a belt in between them, and they're randomly talking about a match two weeks from now with Mickey James, and they're just talking about champions and this and that, this sucked. By the way, the answer is Winter is your champion. Yeah. Winter is a champion, and apparently in two weeks she's going to be facing Mickey James and Mickey James' rematch for the title, and Winter wants Angelina to be in her corner, and I guess we're supposed to just figure that Angelina is going to turn on Winter. Or or Mickey. Or Velvet. I don't care. I don't know. I, I, don't, don't, I don't know what's I don't going care. on here. All I know is that as convoluted and confusing and pointless as this promo was, they managed to say nothing in about 70,000 words. Did you know what was going on here? Am I the only one? I I knew that Winter was champion because I remembered the uh, the horrible match where she won it. It was at the pay per view, and it was the one where Angelina interfered about six times. That's right. Yeah. See, I remember stuff like that. You remember the shit? Oh God, that was a horrible finish. That was a horrible finish. I remember that. Yeah. So uh, that part, that much, I got out of it. Other than that. Yeah, it was it was it was uh, Winter doing a soliloquy about how the belt excites her sexually, which and by the way, it was not exciting. You no. would think this would be hot. It was not. No, in any way. So that sucked. Little Jimmy felt like the backwater was rising during this promo. I suppose. Rob Van Dam wrestled AJ Styles, bound for glory match. Tanae was talking about how uh, AJ Styles had a lot on his mind because, quote, he has the Daniel situation to deal with. Which is what? Well, they didn't explain it, That which is your point, but I will tell you what it was. The Daniel situation is Chris Daniels wants a match. That's the whole thing. Yeah. How hard is it to deal with this? You say yes or you say no. Yeah. This does not need to weigh on your mind. They had the match. Jerry Lynn hit ringside to bitch about a slow count or something. This was an important match, and I'm going to tell you why. Jerry Lynn was, in fact, in the crowd. And at one point, RVD did a rolling thunder. And and uh, 
in runs Jerry Lynn to, to take the ref. He's very angry that the ref, he believes that the ref should have counted faster, that the ref counted too slow on the Rolling Thunder. So the ref goes, get the fuck out of here. So they wrestle some more, and this time uh, AJ hits the Pele, uh, and he goes to cover RVD, and Lynn pulls the ref out of the ring. The referee then proceeds to disqualify AJ Styles, and in doing so, he looks at Jerry Lynn and he explains, and I quote, that's two times. So after all these fucking years, they finally explain that in TNA, it is okay to interfere once. <laughs> but if you interfere two times, that is a disqualification. Now, if they had explained this to me years ago, that would have saved me a lot of fucking heartache. Oh, Brian. Yeah. I, I assume the two times meant two times he had cost Rob Van Dam a match. No, this was what the ref told Jerry Lynn. He said, hey, this is two times. I assume it, I assumed the, it was... So the ref is keeping track of how many points RVD is missing and yes. whose fault it is. I that's, see. That's what I think oh, it wow. is. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, fine. <laughs> but I think my theory is, is, uh, is correct, and I'll talk about that more later on in this show. All right, then. I mean, what makes... Seriously, what makes more sense? The fact that refs pay attention to this fucking show, which is preposterous, <laughs> or the fact that the rules are it is okay to interfere right in front of the goddamn referee one time, but if you do two times, that's a disqualification. I'm not sure either of those make any sense. Really? How many times has Tad said, right in front of the referee? A thousand. Yeah, because it's okay to do it once in a match. But if you Why do it does twice, that make sense? <laughs> listen, I didn't make up this fucking rule. <laughs> I think you did, but anyway. No. So, backstage, just like last time, Rob Van Dam told Jerry Lynn, you just cost me a gazillion points. Because he doesn't know how many fucking points he's lost so and far. And he does not give a shit. Because he doesn't care. He doesn't care. He said, Rob, you've lost. And he said, I don't fucking care. So they had a terrible segment where they yelled at each other for a while. And then, speaking of terrible segments, it's amazing how far our standards have dropped. When this show began, we were like, eh, it's just impact. This show sucked. Ric Flair was talking to himself in the shadows. (laughs) Oh, my God. Let me talk about this segment. (laughs) Here's the whole segment, okay? I'm going to just tell you what happened, then I'm going to go into more detail. The entire story of this segment is Flair is looking for Sting backstage. He can't find him. Eventually, he finds him. Gunner tries to attack Sting, and Sting beats up Gunner. How long did it take me to say that? Less than 10 seconds. Less than 10 seconds. Okay, this segment went on for years. Ric Flair's backstage in the dark looking for Sting. Now, first off, why is Ric Flair backstage in the fucking dark looking for Sting? I don't know. Wasn't it agreed that there was going to be a match tonight? I could have sworn there was. Is it a Falls Count Anywhere now? Is it an Anything Goes match? So he's backstage looking for this guy. And I guess, I don't know, Sting... It's supposed to be like a ninja. Or a all ghost. I, all I know is that, you know in a horror movie where you're you're looking around in a darkened room, and it's very quiet, and there's that sense of suspense, and all of a sudden there's a bang, and you're like, holy shit, what the fuck was that? Not here. Oh, no. Ric Flair's looking around for Sting, and it's a constant stream of bang, clang, bang. Just something falls from the ceiling. Boom, bang, clang, walls, clang. Walls like, falling what down. The fuck is going on? Shelves, pianos tumbling down staircases. Shit's falling down. There's this loud noise. I'm like, Jesus Christ, you can't find this motherfucker. He's, he's, it's like meteors are falling from the <laughs> like sky. Knights in suits of armor were going down, uh, a uh, metal ramp. Holy fuck. So there's just five minutes of, of clanging and Ric Flair looking around and, and talking about shit like he has better things to do in it's Orlando. Like, it was like he was, sounded like he was in a bowling alley. He doesn't like this fucking bowling alley gimmick. He doesn't like the rafters gimmick. This is bullshit. He's yes, I, 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 I never liked that rafters gimmick, he said. And also, Sting, you're not the Joker. Yeah, as he said, you're not the Joker. And that's for goddamn sure. He also the Joker said, was never this fucking loud. He also said, and this is a direct quote, this is bullshit. Yeah. That's what Ric Flair said about this. Yes. I agreed with him. It went on and on and on. And by the end of this, I was sick of Ric Flair. I did not know this was possible. If anybody watched fucking Batman, the Joker took over Gotham because, you know, 
oh, there's a Joker doing some some deed, and now all of a sudden he's gone. Not Sting. Sting is always right there. He's everywhere. Yeah. I don't know if he was... He was literally a bull in a china shop in this fucking segment. So finally... Flair sees him, and it's yes, not even like. Yes. And how does the Sting uh, do? A, uh, uh, does he come down from the rafters on a cable? Does he pop up and he bursts a fire? No, he's just standing he's just there, standing there. He's just there. Flair's like, "Oh, hey, what's happening?" Gunner tries to attack uh, uh, Sting. Sting, of course, kicks his ass. Flair tells Gunner he's fired, which is now the, the second time he has done this, uh, and they've just completely ignored it. And then, of course, backstage here in a random area backstage at Universal Studios, somebody has decided, I'm going to take three tall, wide sets of lockers, and I'm going to stack them together like dominoes. So it'd be impossible to actually use them. But if you throw a man into them, they'll all tumble down, which, of course, is what happens to Gunner. This segment sucked. This is a horrible show. This was horrible. (laughs) This was a goddamn awful goddamn segment. (laughs) <laughs> just shit. So there you go. Crimson limped down to ringside. He called out Kurt. Kurt came out. He said uh, the company wanted to... Uh, the company wanted stars, but they had guys like Crimson, who he called a green, uncoordinated bitch, and said it was his job to make stars. So he said. And he, he gave veiled, uh, uh, veiled references to how he had done this in a prior company. Saying, you know who I'm talking about. Isn't it his job to wrestle and beat men? You know what pissed his me off? his job now to carry them to great matches? You know what pissed me off about this? How much it sucked? No. Well, actually, I, th- I thought this was one of the better segments on the show, believe it or not. I thought that, that Kurt was great. I thought that Crimson actually cut a very good promo. I thought it built up interest in a match between the two. I mean, when you look at the rest of the show, this was like five stars. But... The one thing I hated about the interview is, listen, let's just think about if this were real, if this were UFC, Randy Couture could come out and, and he could find a young guy and, and he could say, listen, you know, um, they want you, they want, they want you to make yourself a name at my expense. That's fine. You know, that that's like a real thing. A young guy comes in, he beats your aging veteran, he makes a name for himself. That's something that happens in real sports, believe it or not. And in the UFC as well. So it's okay to go out there and say that. But when you go out and you say that a guy is uncoordinated and he's green, and they want you to carry him. <laughs> yes. See, that that's not what Kurt said. Bullshit. What you said about Randy saying is not what Kurt said. No, that's the problem. You know, someone with with even like a twenty five percent brain capacity could have written this in in a in a good way, but instead you've got these idiots that write this promo. You know, Russo has no idea what's going on in what, the world. What Kurt said in in very almost these exact words, they want me to carry you to a good match. Yeah, not anything about winning or losing. Yeah, <laughs> I love the line where he goes, "I've been making people my entire career, and where has it gotten me?" And I thought, yeah, impact. Yeah. Sucks to be you. <laughs> it's horrible. He didn't say that, though. He told Crimson he wasn't going anywhere. He had no respect for him. He was green. He, he was a young guy that, that they wanted him to build, this and that. Which, like I said, you know, you, there's a way to do this promo and make it and make it make sense, but this is not how you do it. This is just stupid. They don't know what they're doing. But Crimson, at least, was, was good talking. Crimson didn't do any of this bullshit. He just said, you know, um, let's do this. I'll show you who I am. I'll show you why I'm still undefeated. I'll show you why I'm the future of Impact. And I'll show you why Crimson is the here and the now. They're going to wrestle next week. Okay, see, he never said... What he said was, uh, I dare you to meet me next week. I thought they were going to meet for another promo. No, they're going to have a match next week. I see. Yeah. Well, that makes more sense. I think. You God knows. I, I could be wrong. I did not get. I, I thought he called him out here to, to let him know he was going to call him out again next week. I know they have a That's match. What I so got. unless they had a match on last week's show, they're having a match next week. Hmm. Did they have a match on last week's show? No. All right, so they're having a match next week. Main event, Mexican America versus Beer Money. We were told this is Mexican America's last tag title shot ever. Why? Why not? Exactly. <laughs> Jeff Jarrett was doing commentary. My favorite wrestler. He listed all the great Mexican stars, including the Conquistadors and the Colognes. (laughs) 
<laughs> he's awesome. <laughs> he is fantastic. So, had a match. Jeff Jarrett is like an old Southern style worker in the middle of this. <laughs> this show. Which makes it even better. Yes. So, they had a match. Beer money was involved. It was good. Uh, Let me tell you about this match. All right. So as I noted earlier, it's okay to interfere once. Ah, yes. But if you interfere twice, that's a disqualification. Well, there's more to add to the rule book. It is okay to interfere multiple times, as long as it's a different person every time. Ah, I see. Because you see, the the first person that interfered here was Karen, who ran down and got on... Uh, actually, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, w- I was wrong. In the middle of the comeback, Rosina gets in the ring... And spits beer money, or spits beer on Storm, who is part of beer money. So she gets in the ring and she spits beer at Storm. The referee is fine with this. Because, of course, it's okay to interfere once, you just can't interfere twice. So she leaves, they need more interference, so this time Karen runs down. And she interferes for the first time, right in front of the referee. This also is fine. So then they need to interfere more. So this time Rosita, or I'm sorry, Sarita jumps up on the apron on the outside of the ring and takes a referee. This is also her first time, so it's okay. And then finally Hernandez hits, uh, I believe, Storm or Root or somebody with the belt, and the ref turns around and gets to pin. So to recap, in TNA, the best way to get ahead is to have a big faction. Because then every single one of them is allowed to interfere one time. But if a single person interferes two times in one match, you're disqualified. Why couldn't they just told me this in 2003? Yeah, that fits with what happened on the show. Yeah. That fits perfectly with what happened on the show. Yep. Go back and watch last week's show. Watch next week's show. I guarantee that's what they'll do. Which, again, if you just explain to me, Brian, here are the rules in this promotion. Everyone is allowed to interfere one time. But if you interfere twice, it is a disqualification. If you just explain that to me, it would make this show so much better. I would at least understand what's going on. Well, we'll see. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, the show ended with Mexican America celebrating with their tag belts. They dropped the Mexican flag from the ceiling. Jeff Jarrett was was taking part of the celebration, but not celebrating with them. He was like behind them, posing with a AAA title and Mexican flag. And uh, then the show just kind of abruptly ended. And that was it. See, if the rules are that if you get a championship match and you get beaten clean in the middle, you're entitled to a rematch of the next pay-per-view, just tell me that. You know, just tell me what your shitty rules are. I don't like going in there expecting certain rules that I've, I've grown up with, you know, for the past 36 years. Rules that I know and, and have been the rules of professional wrestling for like 120 years. I don't like it when those are the rules I know and I and I go and watch a show and, and just a bunch of shit happens. You know, if you got brand new rules, brand new goofy rules, just explain them to me. And then it's like, okay, fine. You know, this guy lost in the pay-per-view, but he's getting another shot next month. Great! You know, if you win a ranking match and you're the number three contender, that means that we may never see you again. Good! Just tell me that. Just tell me that those are the rules. Then I'll be okay with it. That's all I'm saying. To the back! Right, let's do this uh, impact board here. This God show sucked. It. This was a terrible show. This show sucked. I had to watch it on my vacation, which was the worst part. Usually I hate the show, and sometimes I... Th- well, usually I hate the show, and oftentimes I think it's because I have to drive out to your house and watch it, and I'm stuck on your couch, and I have stuff to get done around the house I can't do, and it's two hours driving back and forth that I... I I have better things to do, and so I take it on the show. Nope, I watched the show on my couch. It still sucked. This show's awful. Is this it? show in particular, the first half hour of the show was so bad. Well, let's get going. All right. Kurt Angle came out. He uh, was scheduled for the main event match with Crimson tonight. So he called Crimson out. Crimson arrived, and Kurt said that, uh, Crimson was disrespecting him just by challenging him to a match, and so Kurt was going to end his career for disrespecting him. And Crimson said, well, you haven't shown me any respect, and Kurt said, why should I respect you? You're a nobody. So not only is Crimson a nobody, but the 20 guys, or whatever it is he's beaten, also nobodies. Kurt buried the entire roster in one sentence. Crimson vowed to earn some respect. The immortal B-teamers came out. Bubba started putting Kurt over, and Kurt cut off quickly and said that he didn't want any interference in the main event tonight. And that was that. This segment was not what I hated. This segment sucked. You may not have hated it, but I did. Kurt and, and Crimson were, were uh, their delivery was fine. 
But uh, Kurt Baring, the guy, talking about how he's a nobody. This guy is undefeated on your television show, and he has got the most points of anybody in your entire Bound for Glory tournament. Yes. How stupid do you have to be to write this stuff? And number two, in the main event, when they're doing the, the Crimson versus Kurt Angle match, and, and Crimson is getting near falls, he got one near fall, and Taz said, this could be the upset of the century. Yeah. This man but is undefeated. He's beaten like 20 guys. He's number one in your Bound for Glory tournament, and him beating Kurt Angle would be the upset of the century. Does nobody well, think when they write this stuff? I mean, it is a rhetorical question. Of course nobody thinks. The answer, the answer is no. No, they do not. They don't have a, a brain capable of thinking, I've determined. They, they, have, they, have, they have brains that work instinctually. You know, I, I'm sure that Vince Russo has urges to eat and drink. They have, yes, they have nerve endings that, that tell them what to do. And pee and things like that. But actually think, actually logical thinking is, is completely, it, it just, it, they, they do not have these capacities. How can you write a promo like this? How could you simultaneously book a guy as undefeated for months, number one in your tournament, he's beaten everybody, and he's like far out in the lead, and then you book Kurt Angle to come out and say, you're nobody, you're green, you suck, and then Taz talking about how if he wins a match, it'll be the upset of the century. So Crimson winning is a bigger upset than when Jay Lethal pinned Kurt Angle? Yes. This show sucks. And... They do this whole segment, and they talk and talk and talk, and finally Immortals music hits. At which point Mike Tanay says, of all things, like this never happens. Like this doesn't happen at the beginning of every impact. No. So they come out, and literally they came out, and it led to nothing. Bully talked for a second, and then Kurt Angle cut him off, went to the back, segment ended. They just wanted an excuse to play their music and put some faces on television. This segment sucked. Well, then it got worse. It certainly did. We had a backstage uh, segment where Jackie and ODB and Velvet had a had a meeting. This meeting was heavily edited. Uh, was not edited in a way to make sense. They were talking to each other about who had each other's back. Velvet said said she had the other girls back, even though the other girls don't have jobs. And in fact, last I recall, were trying to get into TNA just to get kick Velvet's ass. Now yeah. Velvet says she has their back. I realize I missed a show one week, but I was I was sucked into a black hole in this segment. Yeah. I was so absolutely completely in the dark. I have I have I have no idea. Like I don't even well, have the we... beginnings of an idea of why Velvet Sky, ODB, and Jackie were all of a sudden teaming up together. I mean, in a million years I could not conceive of this ever happening or why. Uh and, and of course nobody bothered to explain it at all. So I don't no. know what's going on here and I didn't care. I just concluded the show sucks. I, 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 I saw the show that you missed. This made no more sense to me. I will just read some of my notes here. Uh, then Jackie says, it's two of us and one of you, and says she can beat up the cameraman. ODB grunts and leaves. I don't have any idea what the fuck I just saw. Then, the next thing we saw was a pair of feet in combat boots walking through a hallway. And then he went to commercial. No Actually, commentary, no questioning what this might be. Just feet in combat boots. This was supposed to intrigue us and make us stick around. Now that you mention this, I have no idea who this was supposed to be. It was revealed in the show. Who was it? It was Anderson. Oh, that's right. Wait a second. He came in in a Humvee. Well, we'll get there, but there. I uh, noted this. Let's see here. Shouldn't they, shouldn't they have shown wheels? <laughs> I suppose. Big giant wheels driving around. I hate this show. I can't find a voice. I wrote down what Tanae said. Anderson arrived. It doesn't matter. <laughs> this, everybody, is why we have Vinny in studio and not on a cell phone. <laughs> Vinny, are you there? And people wonder. Why don't you just call Vinny? Why don't you just call Vinny instead of having him in the studio? Why does Vinny have to be in the studio? Well, now you know. Because he gets sucked into a black hole, much like the one that I was sucked into when trying to explain what the hell was going on with Velvet Sky and ODB and Jackie. And uh, then he vanishes. So hold on and let me get him back here. All right, we have Vinny back. <laughs> As I noted when you were gone, this is why you come to the house. <laughs> I don't know if you heard what I heard, but I heard basically the devil. I heard the same thing. 
All right. Everybody on and this end to, also heard the devil. I tried to call you about four times and it was busy. I thought the devil had taken you. I was trying to call you. All right. <laughs> We're going to get through this show. <laughs> Continue. And I'm going to go immediately out to Walmart and buy a landline. It's probably not a bad idea. I Although, actually have, anyway. I don't cares. have a phone. I just have a place to plug it in. Hmm. All right. We still talked about feet. Uh, they bragged about their ratings in the U.K. and Ireland, and then we got a segment with Eric Bischoff bitching at Ric Flair, and Hulk was bitching at Ric Flair. They weren't happy that Flair agreed to the stipulation that if Sting beat him, he would get a match with Hulk. Hulk was talking about how it was a brand new Sting. He's impervious to pain, Hogan that's, said. That's what he said. He's impervious to pain. Later on the same show, by the way, they talked about Hogan taking a steel chair and beating the bejesus out of Sting. He was not impervious to pain then. Well, he's impervious to, he's a new Sting. He's impervious to pain now. No, this is a Joker Sting. I guess anyway. that's... Anyway. We need to put him together Hogan. along with the uh, the guy that had immeasurable strength. I suppose. What a battle that would be. Sting and Darren Young? That's right. You are literally the only person who ever thought of that match. Immeasurable strength versus impervious to pain. Who wins? <laughs> so Hogan said he was going to go out later to address Sting. He wanted Flair out there to watch his back, but ordered him not to say a word. You know, the article that came out about Ric Flair was a really depressing yep. article, and it was and all he wanted was for uh, for Flair to just not say anything. And Ric Flair, in a complete deadpan, said, <laughs> Well, yeah, what are you going to do? You're going to laugh. We then got the worst match of all time. Angelina and Sarita and Rosita Versus Velvet and ODB and Jackie. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, <laughs> there was an earlier segment to establish that Velvet and ODB and Jackie did not like each other, but best I can tell, they had each other's back, right? That was apparently the angle, yes. That, that happened. So, about 20 seconds into this match, there is a spot where Velvet accidentally hits Jackie 15 seconds later, Mike Nay says the following words, so far, so good, as far as coexisting. Mm-hmm. Mike Nay was too busy reading from his script to watch the match. Yeah. Then Velvet continued to wrestle, or whatever you want to call it. She was so fake. She cannot possibly have been trying to make this look real in any way. This Velvet, Velvet and Sarita together are just the, 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 the rock bottom of wrestling. I like the part where Sarita was on a knee... And Velvet went to hit a low drop kick, which would be a drop kick to the face because she was on a knee. And she hits this move, or at least it appears so. And then Serena just stands up and grabs her feet and hit the worst slingshot ever. This. I'm not even done. So this was the heat on Velvet, this horrible slingshot. The Mexicans then took turns tagging in and out to work her over. Angelina, their partner, was on the apron, upset she was not being tagged in. So effectively, the heels were winning this match two on three. Mm-hmm. They did not even need their partner to, to win this match. So Anthony eventually got tagged in on accident. She uh, got into the ring. Anthony and Velvet then stood there for a second trying to figure out what to do. Velvet had a move that in a million years I could not identify what it was supposed to do or how it worked. There was tons of piped in crowd noise to this. Finally broke down into a six way. Angelina. Okay, get this finished. Angelina and Velvet are in the ring. Angelina lays out Velvet with her move. ODB and Jackie then get in the ring, so you would think, okay, they're going to make the save. But Angelina gestures to them, look, I have taken out Velvet. You're a tag team partner. Now you can attack her. She assumes, you see, she assumes that tag team partners will want to destroy each other, even, even at the cost of losing a match that they have won. Mm-hmm. It is her assumption that they want to destroy Velvet. So the swerve is, they got along. Yeah. This is the swerve. The team acted as a team. <laughs> this segment sucked. This was such shit. <laughs> so, they, yeah, they hit her with a move. She got pinned. The girls won and disappeared. Then Angelina, to drive her point home about how teams are not supposed to get along, she shoved down her Mexican friends, both of them. Mm-hmm. Literally, everything that could have been done badly in this segment was, in fact, done badly. It was, 
in a, in a twisted way, perfect. This was a god-awful segment. And now that you mentioned it, it's something I forgot to mention throughout this show here. This show... I mean, I realize that uh, we'll, we'll, you know when they go on the road, we'll see if it's if it's really better on the road, as they always claim. You know, the Impact Zone did not give a shit about anything on this show. The piped-in booing when Kurt Angle came out at the beginning of the show, the piped-in booing for the other heels, the piped-in cheering for the other baby faces. What I couldn't understand was, listen, I can understand if like you know you really want to get Kurt Angle over as your your top heel and he's your top champion. So hey. Let's uh, let's edit in some booing here. You know, I can understand if the crowd's not reacting to your guys. You know, it's a work. You, you, you're, you're trying to convince the fans. You're trying to fleece the marks, so to speak. So I can understand if people aren't reacting at all to, to Kurt Angle, then you pipe in some booing and that sort of thing. But <laughs> it's just, I could not even believe this show. So if you're going to pipe in booing, why would you only do it for certain segments? Like... There were matches on this know. show. There were matches on this show that the crowd was dead silent. They may as well have been working in a crypt, including at the beginning of this match. The beginning of this match, the crowd, it may have been an empty arena. In fact, an empty arena probably would have been noisier because you would have had rats scurrying about. This was just complete and utter dead silence. So they took the time to pipe in cheering and booing in certain segments on this show. But in other segments, they had no problem with absolute dead silent crowds. And this was one of those matches. An, an absolutely dead silent crowd. And what did they give the absolutely dead silent crowd? An ungodly, horribly booked, preposterous match. This sucked. This was... Yeah. This, this, this was a sin. That's what this segment was, a sin. Velvet and I, you know, I was, I've been a big fan of Sarita for many years, as many people know, but her and Velvet working together, this is a, this is a, a, a comment you hear often, but this is the, this is the God's honest truth. These two cannot work well together to save their lives. Meaning if, if somebody put a gun, if someone went on the, on the apron with a shotgun and they said, you have got to work well together or I'm going to kill you, they'd be dead. They cannot, absolutely cannot work together. It was horrible. God awful. So you had Kid Cash versus Jesse Sorensen. Jesse is one of the exciting new X Division talent guys they brought in. What's his gimmick? He, he plays. Out. He plays. Yeah, football? he comes out with a leather with a Letterman's jacket and he football. What a gimmick! That's his gimmick. He at plays football. Like, at least like Jack Swagger is an amateur athlete who's now a pro. <laughs> this guy's gimmick. He's a wrestler whose gimmick is that he plays football. What? Yeah. Yes. First, okay. A couple things here. First of all. My first thought is he comes in and, he, and it's the thing where wrestling is the second job of the early 90s WWE where everyone had to be a garbage man or a plumber or a clown. Jesse Sorensen is a football player who wrestles on the side. Number two, like he's the first football player ever to get into wrestling. You know, like that's a novelty. Yeah. Like someone who's good at another sport might try this wrestling thing. Number three, it's not like he was a famous football player. It's not like he was a college star. It's, no one's ever heard of this guy. He just played football as a kid. Who gives a shit? <laughs> well, we're supposed to. So they wrestle for two minutes. Kid Cash won with the roll-up where he grabbed the tights. So Aries is no longer the only X Division guy who cheats to win. Oh, you missed the uh, the best part where he, he pulled the tights and Brian Hebner was staring right at it and still counted the pin. Because no one sure. knows what they're doing on this show. Of course not. Of course how can not. you be the son of, of Earl Hebner and not know how to referee? I don't know. I don't know. But then, then after this match, so they had a match and Kid Cash won. After he defeated his opponent in a match, he then cut his uh, promo on his opponent to hype the match. Yeah. He started calling him a boy and saying he was going to whip his ass. I thought, you just did. I watched you whip his ass right here in front of me. They did a match and then shot an angle to add heat to it afterwards. Yeah, for those of you that think Vinny is kidding, they, they cut the promo and shot the angle for the match. After the match had already concluded, yes. Kid Cash and Jesse Sorensen came out. Nobody had done a pre-match promo. They just brought these oh. guys to the ring cold. One guy had a goofy gimmick. One guy is called Kid Cash, and he looks like he's in his 40s. The guy that's in his 40s beat the young guy holding his trunks right in front of the referee as the referee's looking right at it. And then the old guy goes outside, and he proceeds to cut a promo on the young guy saying that, I'm going to beat your ass. And then they proceed to have a pull apart after the match has already occurred. We, we say this sometimes, 
maybe we're exaggerating or or, no, or not metaphorically. At all. This is exactly this was, what happened. No, yeah, but what I mean, what I mean is sometimes we say something is backwards, we mean it metaphorically or or, or something. No, this was literally backwards. Mm-hmm. They did it in the opposite order of how it's supposed to be done. You know, if 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 this newfangled style of wrestling was something where like the place was going nuts and you were doing great business and you know that'd be one thing, but you're drawing 300 people on the road, 300 people. Yeah, I did shows for ICW in Tacoma that did 600 people. Yeah, Impact is drawing 300 people on the road. They're doing the same ratings they've always done. They're they're under 7,000 in pay per view buy rates, which is is I mean it's impossible to even fathom. So this is not oh, working. Not. This newfangled style of wrestling is not working. It's a failure. That's yes, it is a failure. So it stop is a it. Failure. I'm, I'm stunned to get seven thousand buys. Stop booking this. I'm gonna pay for this shit. I don't know. There's seven thousand people though that will pay for this every month. It's ridiculous. We had clips of Bound for Glory matches on the house shows. They don't even show all the results anymore. They just show some action and guys cut promos, including Gunner telling us, "Quote: Gunner is gunning for number one." Hmm. I like and when. They I like when they showed clips of uh, of uh, RVD losing to Bobby Roode, and then they go to RVD for his post fight interview. He's like, "Eh, he's pretty good. Totally doesn't care. He's a good wrestler." He said, "Yeah, yeah." So they show the leaderboard. The top four move on, so that's what's really important. And the top four at this point were Crimson, Bobby Ray, Bobby Roode, and James Storm, with. Gunner, Rob Van Dam, and AJ uh, following them, and then Devon and Morgan have both been eliminated by injuries. Yes. So we had Rob Van Dam versus Pope. Wait a second, Devon's out with an injury. What happened to him? Uh, Joe took him out. I think he took him out so badly he's out of the tournament. Apparently. Oh my God! This thing's show. Oh, <laughs> Rob Van Dam versus the Pope. This match, they did not actually pipe in reaction. There, were, there was a, uh, there was legit heat for this, and it was fine. There were two key spots. One was the finish. Uh, before the finish, Rob Van Dam hit a monkey flip, and he monkey flipped the Pope into the stars. He may have come, the Pope may have come down in Vatican City, now that I think about it. He launched this fucker. And then later, he's working him over, and he goes for a submission hold. I got to I I talk about this. Okay. <laughs> it's it, I, I cannot believe what I was seeing, but to be fair, uh, the finish did make sense. Although it was just completely ridiculous. RVD, um, Pope ends up on his stomach. And RVD bends his legs and he steps on his his legs and he he slaps him on the sides and grabs his arms and pulls him back and hoists him up into an inverted surfboard. He then proceeds to uh, slowly lower Pope down so that Pope's shoulders are on the mat in a pinning position. The ref counts one, the ref counts two, RVD powers him back up to inverted, surf, inverted surfboard position. At which point I would thought, why would you do that? What are you doing here? And then I realized that, in fact, RVD could have gotten seven points for the pinfall. But instead, he wanted ten points for the submission. So this actually made sense. Now, that's the good news. The bad news is, the Pope submitted to an inverted surfboard. The first man in 50 years to submit to this I, move. I wrote 30 years. 50! Regardless. Well, I guess if you, long- if you went down to Mexico, there are people submitting to this move on a weekly basis. But on American television, no one has submitted to an inverted surfboard literally in probably 50 years. Yes. And the same thing was, too. Not only is I mean, it, it, it's a move you see all the time, and you know that no one has ever won with it, but... You know, guys get put in this move and they escape. Rob locked Pope in this hold, and Pope was helpless for like a minute. Yeah, he could not get out. There's nothing he could do. And finally he had to give up. The pain was too great. I do so, I do have to give... I will give this segment a thumbs up, just because we saw a submission to an inverted surfboard. Yes. Which the funny thing is, if you actually look at an inverted surfboard, what's the problem? I don't know. I've never been in one. I don't even know what what where where the pain would be coming from. Is it is it the fact that you're pulling the man's arms together and it's stretching out his pecs? What what, what is it here? Does he have a weak I, I, core and it's it's hurting his his belly? Next time I'm over there, I will put you in one. We'll see what hurts. All right, it'll probably hurt you more with your bum knee trying to hoist me up like that. <laughs> you never know. Maybe it will. You're the one that may submit. 
I, I have always thought the part about standing on the guy's legs to set up the move would be the worst part. Yeah, that'd be far worse than actually hoisting him upside down. That would be kind of fun. It'd be like you're on the on a ride. Yes. So the other question here, Rob got 10 points for the submission. So that moved him off the leaderboard. That's fine. But didn't they just spend two to three weeks having Jerry Lynn interfere in all of Rob's matches to knock him down the standings? Vinny, I don't even think about this shit anymore. It's just What's infuriating. What's the point of that now? It's just infuriating. There was no mention of Jerry Lynn on the show. You can't think so about it. So after the stuff. match, after the match, Samoa Joe attacked Pope. Devon limped out in his knee in a brace. He was also wearing an Under Armour shirt, and we've talked about how uh, the, the former Dudley boys have both lost a ton of weight, and this made it clear. Devon has lost a ton of weight. And he methodically came out, and he ordered his boys to sit down and demanded a chair. He, he made the save, but he did so in as slow a manner as possible, and you think, well, here's the part, part where he's going to kill Pope for no reason. And then again, he didn't kill him, and that was the swerve. So he's too hurt to be in the tournament, but he can come out and make the save? Yeah. Hmm. All right. <laughs> That's what happened. We got a commercial for Direct Auto Insurance, their new sponsor. It was TNA wrestlers talking about why they like Direct Auto Insurance. It was funny. I don't think I want to buy direct auto insurance now. Yeah. Robbie E. approached Rob Terry. They're both still employed. Robbie E. wanted to team up with Rob Terry, and uh, his sales pitch for teaming up included not only do they have the same name, but he said Rob was having a terrible year, he'd been kicked out of Immortal, and, quote, you have two left feet in the ring. Mm -hmm. He said, you're a clumsy oaf, basically. Hell of a spiel. And Rob Terry, who had just been called a clumsy oaf by this little twerp from Jersey with the weird hair, said, I'll think about it. <laughs> That's what he said. <sighs> yeah. I'm thinking this up, folks. This is what happened. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. We had a segment where Immortal shouted at each other. It was Rob Terry, or it's not Rob Terry, uh, Gunner. Actually, I want to talk about this. 99 right. times out of 100. On an impact show where there is a segment that consists solely of people screaming at the top of their lungs, I hate it. But yes. because we had Bully Ray, who is a great promo, and Scott Steiner, who is a crazed, insane madman, and Gunner, who is just so completely out of place, this was awesome. This was great. Uh, Ray was uh, using Steiner's uh, workout equipment. This infuriated Scott Steiner. You don't know how to it's use that, he said. Yeah, the, 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 you're doing curls with that rubber band thing. So, yes, I did enjoy this. Steiner and Bubba have awesome chemistry. Yes, they do. They, they, there are a few men who are okay with shouting at each other for no reason, but Steiner and Bubba, I'm great with it. How ever? The very next segment. Oh, this is the polar, the same thing, only the polar opposite reaction. Angelina was laying on a couch. The Mexicans walked in and screamed at her. I just love how, like, uh, a month ago, Angelina Love was like this crazed, drugged-up zombie. And now she's lounging on a couch talking on her cell phone. Yeah. She's fine. Idiotic. Now. So they screamed at each other for a while. Violence erupted. Winter arrived. There was more screaming. There was more bleeping. Hernandez and uh, Anarchia showed up. They all screamed at each other. This was... Shit. Hogan and Flair walked around. They looked like they were the walking. They looked like they were walking through the halls of a retirement house. It was very sad. They're old. They looked a thousand years old, moving as slowly as possible. It was. It was. I, I, I shed a tear. They're old. Following this, we got another shot of mysterious combat boots walking down a random hallway. Tracy Brooks met with Eric Bischoff. Showed her cleavage. They agree to get cocktails. Cocktails. Get it? Get it? Yeah. She's still... Cocktails. They actually, at the end of this show, I am not making this up. One of the teases for next week's live... Well, supposedly live. They're on the road. They're on the yeah. road. Big impact show. One of the hooks for next week's show is that we're going to find out if Tracy gets to come back as Knockout Law. Yes. You saw that, too. I'm not kidding. They actually... You know, sometimes you see stupid stuff on Impact, and you're like, well, you know, it's a two-hour show. They got to fill some time here. You know, they just, they're just they throwing some shit against a the wall. They're just doing this. They're just doing that. No. These people think this knockout law storyline is so compelling 
that they're using it as a hook for next week's show. Does anyone remember a thing about Knockout Law except Tracy's cleavage? No. This is a storyline from like three years ago that led to absolutely nothing, that nobody cared about, that was stupid. And now they're bringing it back, and they actually think that this is like, oh my god, we're going to pull in a ton of viewers trying to find out if Tracy is being brought back as Knockout Law. Boggles the mind. So Hogan and Flair hit the ring. Before they could say anything, Sting interrupted. Came down to the ring. Hulk tried to play nice. Said he and Eric were going to do things the right way. He tried to play nice? (laughs) He went out there and he tried to make amends by telling Sting that he was a crazed madman who was completely out of his mind. He did say that, yes. But then he said that he and Eric were going to lead the company in the right direction and he offered a handshake. Sting said, okay, on one condition. Then listed about 50 conditions, which was things like the audience would get milk and cookies and everyone would get a puppy. And then he started talking about flowers. I thought for sure he was going to throw out WWE ice cream bars. He started talking about flowers and acting very effeminate. This terrified Hulk Hogan. Mm -hmm. This was scarier to Hulk Hogan than seeing Warrior in the Mirror. Mm -hmm. Sting was acting girly and talking about flowers. Then he hugged Hulk and he kissed Hulk. So Hogan was petrified. In 2011, Mm -hmm. Flair was irate. He attacked Sting. He said, oh, he would show you crazy. You know, the thing about Flair in this segment is that I just had read the article about Flair. I just read the article about all his problems. I just read the article about how he had no health insurance, uh, no life insurance. I just read the article where they, and he has denied this, by the way, although he he actually claimed in his own book that he has uh, alcoholic uh, basically heart disease uh, brought on by too much alcohol. And uh, I was just sitting there going, please, dear God, do not let these two men talk me into wanting to see them have a match. And um, I still don't think Ric Flair should ever wrestle again for his own health. But uh, these two guys, as far as just like having a confrontation to build up a match, they were so awesome. Ric Flair talking about how, listen, you're you're trying to act all crazy. You ain't got nothing on me. I am crazy. I'm going to kick your fucking ass. He was so great, and Sting was so great. And it's like, I don't give a shit about Flair and, or Sting and Hogan or anything else I think that's going to draw. Sting and Flair could talk me into wanting to see them have a match again. Hmm. I was not moved. Really? I, I thought, thought they was, were great. I thought it was two, two senile senior citizens acting crazy. Well, that's not what it was. Crazy. Not scary crazy, not entertaining crazy, not funny crazy, kind of sad crazy. Well, yeah, but look what else we have. What are our other options on impact? I don't, who cares? <laughs> so I, I, don't want, I don't want to watch any of that shit either. It's, this was, it was, it was, yeah, it was my, my, my notes here read. No idea what the point of this was. They asked crazy to each other for a while. That was it. I thought they did a very good job setting up a match. Well... Good for you. I was not not uh, I was not into it. It was not horrible. I'll tell you the horrible shit on the show. But do I, did it make me want to see Sting versus Ric Flair? No. Maybe if they played the match from 1989, I would want to watch that. AJ and Chris Daniels came out. AJ wanted to know why Daniels wanted a rematch. See, I Daniels have no said, idea. I have no idea how you could not be moved by the the Sting. Uh, Flair segment setting up a match when it was followed by this. Two guys who are supposed to be baby faces, and they both come out there, and they're both so whiny and so yeah. pathetic. And AJ is supposed to be this this great beloved character, and he's out there trying to avoid a match with Chris Daniels. And Chris Daniels is out there trying to explain that because I lost a match with AJ, I'm so sad I may quit. And please, yeah. can I have another match? And he's weeping. This was yeah. this was the I hate words like this, but this was the definition of a bromance segment, and it sucked, <laughs> and it just sucked. Yeah, no, this was awful. Don't get me wrong, this is freaking terrible does not make Sting and Flair better. It was better than this. But, yeah, this this was horrendous. My favorite was when Chris Daniels said that the pay-per-view they had was about, quote, the spirit of competition, whatever. So, 
after all this stress and grief, the weeks and weeks of questions, the weeping here in the ring, AJ said, uh, he said, let, Daniel said, let's do it no surrender. AJ said, can't do it then. I'll be in the tournament finals. Let's do it next week. Chris said, okay, and left. Why did this conversation not take three minutes a month ago? I don't know. Why, why did it take so long to get to this point? This was awful. AJ and Beer Money versus Bubba and Steiner and Immortal. Abyss was out to wash. I don't think he did anything. Uh, I guess it was a Falls County Anywhere match. There was action all over the place, back in the locker rooms, crowd brawling, all that stuff. AJ appeared to blow out his knee on a dive and then kept wrestling, so I guess he's fine. And it was not. I thought it was going to be storyline, actually. So they brawled all over the building. Gunner and Storm, James Storm, brought into a locker room where Gunner tipped one of their portable locker segments. They are now on every show. He tipped one over on the Storm, pinning him. I thought, well, if he falls count anywhere match, just climb on top of the lockers and win. Nope, he went to the ring. And it's a Bound for Glory series match where only one man can get points, no matter who gets the pin for his team. So they're all beating up AJ, and Bubba hits the Bubba bomb, and Scott Steiner is standing right there, right there. And Bubba makes the cover, and Scott has to suddenly, mysteriously turn away and start selling. Mm-hmm. So he did not break up the pin. They spent an entire segment building up AJ versus Daniels as a big match for next week. And then in a completely random six-man Falls Count Anywhere match, they just beat AJ. Yes. Yes. These people are idiots. That happened, too. There was so much wrong with this. I didn't even notice that, but you were correct. But, yes, earlier on the show, Angelina was stunned that her opponents would work together to win a match. And the opponents worked together, and that was a swerve. Here... There was incentive for teammates to fight, and they didn't. The show is shit, everyone. The show is a pile of reeking shit. Do not watch it. The it entire must die. point of this, the entire point of having having Bound for Glory tournament matches and tag team was to give people an excuse to actually fight for once. And so far, think, nobody ever has. No, ever. Here, not in a single match of tag here, team partners fought Scott, over this. Scott Steiner had to go out of his way to not fight. Yes. He had this to find something to do so he didn't break up a pin. This tournament sucks. This show sucks. This show sucks. This company sucks. People in charge sucks. If you ever bought a ticket for... Well, the live shows are good. If you ever bought a pay-per-view, you suck. Everything sucks. So, Mortal Ground a table. They were going to put AJ through it. And then Mr. Anderson arrived in his Hummer. He came down to ringside. Don't ask me how he got a Hummer into the impact zone. So he came down to ringside. He couldn't drive the Hummer down to ringside. He had to walk down there. And Mortal had to pretend he could not see him because there were three of them. Mike today said, now we know who's been skulking around all night in those combat boots. We're supposed to care. We're supposed to be surprised. We're supposed to be impressed. I don't know. No one cares. So Anderson jumped in the ring. How many people started- in their careers have tried to be a Ric Flair ripoff and just fallen flat on their face? The list right goes on and on. And here's this fool trying to be a stone-cold Steve Austin ripoff. And <laughs> I can think of a hundred men who I'd at least try to make the next Stone Cold, and he doesn't even get in the top 500. No. Oh. So he jumps in the ring. He starts beating up Gunner. The other guys in the mortal have to pretend they can't see this. I don't know what happened to Bubba. Scott Steiner... When he saw Anderson get into the ring, he actually in real life saw this happen and then immediately turned his back to make, uh, to, in as complicated a manner as possible, grab himself and AJ and take them both with the apron. The whole while having to pretend like he could not see what was going on in the ring as one man beat up his partner. So he finally gets himself out there in as uh, uh, deliberate a manner as possible. And uh, Anderson hit him, knocked him through a table. Bubba Ray ran for his life, so Anderson grabbed a chain, and he made Gunner bleed a lot, and he posed over both their bodies. So, yes, they couldn't even have it be in two, one week he took out Steiner, the next week he took out Gunner. He had to take them both out in one segment. Sure. Stare down, Bubba. This is awful. Mickey got a promo. This is actually a good promo. Winter. A fine promo by Mickey. She said she would beat Winter and get her belt back. Yeah, did a good job. Yeah, it was fine. There was shit with Eric Young. 
Crimson versus Kurt Angle in the main event. You're having a good match. Yes, Crimson is, in fact, good enough to have a good, good match with Kurt Angle. When, after Kurt opened the show saying he did not want interference, Crimson hit his finisher, and Samoa Joe hit the ring and attacked him for the disqualification. Mm-hmm. Kurt, who said he did not want interference, looked around, looked at Joe, left. Didn't yeah. care. So, Joe went to attack Crimson more. Crimson fought him off. They stared each other down for a while. Nobody gave a shit next- about the finish of this match. I mean, mm-hmm. it wasn't even people booing. It wasn't people no. cheering. It was just people that just went quiet. Why? Because you beat Samoa Joe over and over and over and over again. He ends up with minus 10 points. He didn't lose 10 points in a match. He Well, he did. But he it's not like he had 40 points, and then he had managed to lose 10, and so now he has 30. No, he had zero points, and then he lost 10, so he has minus 10 points. And now we're supposed to care when Joe runs in to beat somebody up. Nobody cares. They have killed Joe dead. And now, after... Think about this. They booked it in such a way to kill Joe dead. And now their idea is, now that he's dead, let's push him. Yeah. Hmm. I don't know. Hmm. So, of course, he runs in and nobody cares. He beats up Crimson and nobody cares. And that's how the show went off the air with a guy that they killed, that they are now pushing to beat up Crimson, and nobody cares. Yeah. So presumably he put show, Crimson out of the tournament. I don't, has- I don't know for sure, but presumably he has put Crimson out of the tournament after dropping something on his foot. I, 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 yes, I, I, they, had, they had another brawl backstage, and he broke a board over his leg on some stairs. So probably, that would probably be how they have him, uh, they, can, they can knock him out of the tournament, and still claim he is undefeated. Yeah, that did wonders for Christian when he he uh, won and lost the title like two times, and he was still undefeated mm-hmm. the entire time. He was undefeated and a two-time former champion. Mm-hmm. So, These people yeah, are this so stupid. Awful. So stupid. So fucking wretched. This show sucks, everybody. Just watch it and do what I do. No, no, don't watch it. Well, that's that's a good point. But if you have to watch it, God knows you're one of the poor people that has to watch this show. Just watch the show. Then write your report or do your audio talking about how stupid the show is, and then completely block it out of your mind and move on with your life. That's what I have. I am now doing, and I feel much better about it. So I am immediately erasing it from my mind right now, and uh, that's the end of the show. How'd you like that? Impact sucks. We're going to wrap it up. I got a show with Dave later on tonight, everybody. So uh, as you're listening to this, be prepared for more later on. Uh, got a lot to talk about, and then uh, everything will be back to normal tomorrow after the UFC show. We'll be back home watching uh, UFC in Rio. Hopefully nothing crazy happens. I know the way in all of the uh, fans were threatening the uh, white folk with death if they were facing a, uh, a Brazilian. So hopefully everything turns out all right. But uh, we'll be back to talk about that tomorrow. So that is it. And, uh, yeah, we're done. We'll talk to you again after a while. I'm off to be eaten by a shark.